Okay, terrific. Well, good morning, everyone. I am Cindy Collins, and I lead the cell therapy business at uh, GE Healthcare. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, in this session this morning, we're going to talk about uh, the outlook for hematological disorders, and specifically gene therapies, and maybe more specifically hemophilia. Um, as you know, the industry faces many challenges uh, in the cell and gene therapy in industries, such as uncertainty around regulatory guidelines, security of supply chain, intellectual property, market access, reimbursement, uh, et cetera. And so as we think about the impact of cell and gene therapies on the industry, it's really quite profound. These therapies have the potential to uh, improve patient outcomes, and in some cases we've seen actually cure patients, and ultimately can reduce the overall cost of healthcare within our system. And while there's been a lot of focus in many of the conferences over the past years around cost of goods, what I'd like uh, to really challenge the industry to think about is what can we do to address some of the challenges that I mentioned to really speed up the clinical development pathway and to bring these therapies to commercialization much sooner. And we at GE are focusing on many of these problems, trying to solve them by bringing tools and services to the industry, to industrialize the industry, to create an ecosystem, and to continue to drive uh, the industry forward. We've made a number of significant investments over the past year, and we'll continue to uh, work within the industry to continue to, to bring more uh, tools and products to, to uh, our, our customers. This morning, you're gonna hear about um, some of the specific key issues that are facing uh, the panelists that are with me today, and specifically, you'll hear uh, some uh, challenges around vector production, both in terms of capacity, but some of the technical challenges around those, some of the issues associated with being able to put together robust CMC packages, uh, clinical trials, and then ultimately what needs to happen uh, to drive commercialization. So I'd like to welcome uh, my two distinguished panelists this morning, Dr. Michael Linden, who is with us from Pfizer, and Dr. Amit Beth Bothy, who is with us from UCL and also is involved in a startup company, Freeline Therapeutics. So what I'd like to ask them to do is, uh, is to each uh, introduce themselves, their background, the programs that they're working on, and maybe identify a couple of uh, key challenges that they face today, and then we'll uh, continue to, to dive in and, and have some questions from me as well as perhaps from the audience as well. So with that, Mike, Michael, if I could ask you to, to kick it off. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me here. And let's see how this develops. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so Michael Linden, I'm uh, um, the head of the Genetic Medicines Institute for Pfizer, and that's here in London, actually quite close by, uh, near, near St. Pancras. What's the Genetic Medicines Institute? What have I done? So I'm, I'm a molecular virologist by, by training. I've been a faculty at King's up to two years ago. And at a certain point, Pfizer asked me to help them guide this novel therapeutic approach into the context of the, of, of the, of the big company. So for me, with that regard, so that I'm, I'm, I'm working at the, at the pharma end of a very young therapeutic modality, and the question then really was, well, what do we, what do we need to do to enable this company and, um, and, and others potentially to, to incorporate a novel therapeutic modality? What are the complexities? What do we have to put in place? And, and, <coughs> and that's been incredibly interesting because, um, uh, you know, as you all know, these, 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 these vectors are fantastically promising, as shown in a number of um, uh, academic clinical trials. And the question then uh, comes up, well, how do you get that from, from these promising initial studies really to, to the market as a, as, a, as a viable medicine? And by viable, I mean, of course, therapeutically viable, but then also commercially 
um, doable and, and, and so on. And what we've pretty early on you know, recognized is that there are a number of areas that, that are very important in this space. Um, the, the IP situation around AAV vectors, which is what we initially focus on, is very complex. So how can you get access to IP where you have a number of serotypes, a large number of AAV serotypes that specifically target particular tissues? Well, if you have the, the wish to develop a, a therapy, you need to have freedom to operate in this, and that's not trivial in this space. So we actually decided to, to really build our own portfolios and vector from vectors from the from the very beginning. And the concept that Pfizer has really deployed is sort of a build and buy philosophy. So to build a strong internal capability on one hand and then to buy assets around it. And that is true. Um, that that works in our case as well for, for vectors. So we've partnered with King's College uh, London to get access to a particular vector system with the University of Iowa to get exclusive access and so on. And now with Bamboo Therapeutics that we've um, acquired quite recently, again, a set of uh, novel vectors. In addition to that, we're actually creating our, uh, our own, and I think this is going to be quite, quite important because these vector technologies evolve further. So there's now a panel of possible, possible, possible vectors that one can pick from. But as we learn more about the biology of these particular entities, we, we can in fact improve them, try to identify ones that, that see less of the human immune system and so on and so forth. That's, that's one area, IP, and this extends beyond the capsule. The other area is, of course, the elephant in the room. It's not that easy to, to make this stuff, to produce it, and certainly not to produce it at standards that are acceptable to, to Pfizer and, 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 and like. Uh, so we have a lot of um, activities in the space of manufacture, which was enhanced again also through the, through the acquisition of, of bamboo, which arguably might have the, the you know, largest capacity currently and, 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 and so on. And then the last thing that I'd like to highlight here, despite the fact that this won't be the last challenge in the space, is, is, is really the standards around the around so there are many studies out there around AAV, yet we don't fully understand the determinants of, of the bioactivity of the, of the entities. And, and what that means really is it becomes very difficult to compare one study to the other. And, and really, I think what the field needs to do in, uh, what the field needs to do is to start establishing analytic systems that are, that are transferable from one entity to the other that we can really start doing this. And one of the reasons I'm saying this is that bioactivity in part is very strongly affected by manufacture, manufacture approaches. So if you, if you produce a vector, which you can in an in a insect cell system, bacular virus, and then the identical vector you produce in a mammalian system in 293 cells, you actually get different bioactivity. And I think Amit has done some work in this space as well to, to, uh, to compare. And we need to get a handle on understanding that, so we're investing quite a bit in the analytic, analytic capacities. And then I think I'll stop here for now. Hi, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm a clinician, so I'm here by false pretenses. Um, but it's good to be here, and thank you for the invitation. So I'm a simple hematologist, and uh, my aim uh, has been to develop transformative medicines, medicines that uh, involve a single administration of a therapeutic that results in lifelong transformative improvement in patient care and patient outcomes. And, and with this in mind, some 20 years ago, um, I started working on gene therapy for hemophilia, uh, and hemophilia B in particular. And at that time, we were miles behind our competition, uh, Kathy High, who was, who was really the pioneer in this field and was uh, storming ahead with clinical trials out of CHOP uh, in the United States, initially involving the muscle uh, and then targeting the liver. So we really had quite a bit of competition and had to come up with 
uh, clever ideas of how we can make gene therapy for hemophilia B work. And that was an important starting point because we realized that if we can't make it work for hemophilia B, then we're not going to be able to make it work for a vast number of disorders that we're interested in, uh, where the standard of care is substantially lower than that for hemophilia B. So, uh, working in collaboration with St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and my group at University College London, uh, we developed a distinctive approach uh, using AAV8 capsid uh, for hemophilia B gene therapy, and we showed uh, for the first time that you could get stable expression of the factor IX protein, which is missing in these patients with hemophilia B, uh, and that this expression remains long term. Our first patient was treated in 2010, uh, is now six, over six and a half years uh, post-administration of a single uh, uh, AAV vector, and he still expresses factor IX at therapeutic levels and has come off prophylaxis, uh, and this has essentially transformed his life. Uh, we then went on and treated 10 other patients, uh, and uh, seven of the 10 who were on prophylaxis were able to stop uh, prophylaxis uh, and have remained of prophylaxis uh, throughout this period of observation over the last six years. Um, and again, uh, there are four patients there who've had no treatment whatsoever because we've achieved levels in these patients that transform their clinical phenotype from a severe bleeding disorder to one that is a mild uh, disorder where they can go about their normal activity without worrying about having a spontaneous bleed. So this has made a big difference. Of course, uh, NHS England is very happy with this because what we've done uh, through this is um, essentially saved them uh, approximately five million, and this is accruing as these patients have come off prophylaxis. And this five million results just from a reduction uh, in the use of uh, uh, factor IX protein concentrate. So we're not even taking into consideration that these patients now uh, come to hospitals less frequently, uh, they continue to stay at work or school more often because they don't have these bleeds. And so all of the other social and economic impacts of gene therapy are not currently still measured. Now, it, it hasn't been plain sailing for us because some of our patients, and particularly at the high dose, did suffer toxicity, and this was a subclinical transaminitis inflammation of the liver. But again, in our trial, we were able to show that this can be controlled uh, using a very low dose of steroids. It's the kind of dose that I normally take when I have flare-up of asthma. Um, and this is a transient treatment. It rescues factor IX expression, controls the inflammation of the liver, and, and this, this toxicity does not reoccur. So, over the longer term follow-up of these patients, we have not seen any other toxicity. So that's one issue that we need to address, but it is dose-dependent, and if we can get the dose lower, then I don't think this will be a major problem moving forward. The other issue, of course, uh, is the fact that a significant number of patients have natural immunity to uh, the AAV capsids that we are using. And I think that is an important challenge in this field. So we have established that gene therapy for hemophilia B works. But what we've also shown is that a significant proportion, and that's about 25% in our, our um, population, it's 50% for SPA, it's 50% for Baxelta. So a significant proportion of patients are not candidates for gene transfer because of the fact that they've been exposed to the wild type capsid uh, and, and therefore have immunity and cannot receive the gene transfer benefit. So this means either that we develop a suite of capsids, as Mike has uh, alluded to, or we begin to develop clever approaches uh, that allow us to get in under the radar and, and affect gene transfer. So that's one issue. The other issue is obviously uh, the packaging capacity of AAV, which is really quite small. Uh, and so that means that only a small number of disorders that we would like to target uh, would be amenable for gene therapy. And so what we began to do after our success uh, with hemophilia B is to start looking at a larger problem, which is hemophilia A. This is much more common 
and is much more problematic clinically than hemophilia B. Now, the problem with hemophilia A is that the gene is much larger. Uh, and to sort of find ways of packaging this larger gene into a vector system that is otherwise safe and effective was an important challenge. And so we started working on this uh, around 2010 and, and developed a, uh, uh, an approach that allows packaging of oversized genomes. And as you have seen from some of the data that has been released by Biomarine, that our oversized uh, factor eight expression cassette developed at UCL uh, and uh, evaluated in the phase one clinical trial performed by Biomarine shows that you can now get expression of factor eight in the normal range. This is something I didn't think was going to be possible when we started the clinical trial. Uh, but it's a remarkable achievement partly because of the fact that the levels of factor VIII required to achieve normalization uh, of this protein in the circulation are lower than for factor IX. But it's still an amazing achievement. And again, the only toxicity seen in this trial is uh, transient inflammation of the liver. Otherwise, patients are able to receive the vector without any problem. So, this opens up another uh, opportunity. Now we can begin to target disorders that we felt were not approachable using AAB-mediated gene transfer. Uh, and so I think that is another important milestone that we've been able to achieve over this time. Now going forward, I completely agree with Mike that production is an important issue. But I think as with antibodies, as this field now begins to mature, I'm pretty sure that the production issues are going to be tackled effectively. Uh, but, you know, the other point that is important to us as clinicians is cost of goods. And what we want is a treatment that is amenable and, and available to the rest of the world. And so we need to get production effectively at a level where the cost of goods are low enough so that everyone in the world can have this sort of simple vaccine type approach treatment which is essentially a hit and run strategy where you administer the vector and then the patients really don't have to worry for the rest of their life. So the cost of goods really needs to be brought down and this is something that is important to us as clinicians, perhaps less so to industry, but I think it is an important target for us. The other issue is the quality of the goods. Now, you know, we're used to making AAV in my back garage. And, you know, that's fine. It works. We've shown that it works with hemophilia A, hemophilia B. But as we move forward, we need to improve the quality of the goods because I think that will improve efficacy of the vectors. But in addition, I think it will reduce some of the toxicities that we're seeing. So in addition to the immunological aspects that we need to develop, which can be handled through a suite of uh, um, different capsids, and there are now a wide variety of synthetic capsids that are available that could be used, or using uh, immunological approaches to try and get them under the radar. Really need to understand how we can improve quality. And in the company that I founded with uh, support from Synchrona, this is an important priority for us, that we need to get the quality right, because as we move forward, this is something that the regulators are going to pay a lot of attention to, which is something they've not done. Uh, to this point. So this, I think, is where we are. We've developed a platform that is now widely used, and since we started our uh, pivotal trial in 2010, there are now, I think, seven companies. I lose count because there's a company developed every day looking at hemophilia gene therapy that are looking at this in the same way. But we have learned the lessons from our previous clinical trials, and in uh, Freeline, the company that I founded, we're now looking at the next generation technology to see if we can improve uh, levels of gene transfer using substantially lower doses of vector. And that is quite important because that will reduce toxicity, it will reduce the cost of goods. And this is the way that we think the field will move forward in the future. And with that, I will stop. Great. Thank you very much. And very exciting, the, the progress that you've made in, in both uh, hemophilia B and hemophilia A. Michael, when we spoke, um, we talked a, a little bit about some of the challenges within the industry. We talked about the difficulty in producing vectors, different serotypes, uh, you know, the, the clinical impact that has, et cetera. But you also spoke a little bit about um, you know, the difference between maybe startup mentality 
and big pharma and as you're developing products and trying to uh, move them forward in the industry, you know, maybe uh, just an awareness of uh, differences in terms of how small company, big company thinks about development and, and the rigor perhaps behind that. And any thoughts you want to share with us around um, that? Yes, yeah, so um, I probably wouldn't, wouldn't describe it the, the, in the sense of mentality differences. Uh, I, I think we all share really the same, the same goal. I think it's a continuum really, as Ahmed described, that a lot of um, the vector work that was done since 19, uh, AAV gene therapy and uh, gene therapy overall since 1999, was really done in, in, in an academic environment with the limited resources that academia had. And, and only, only later, much later, was sufficient interest there to, it was investment there again that allowed spin out companies, small companies to start, to start building, uh, building a portfolio. And really only a very short period of time now have large pharma, which has really the, the um, as I'm learning now, um, you know, the depth of understanding in the, in the drug development arena um, that, that is contributing that knowledge to there. So what I think is that there are these stages, right, the sort of academic, uh, academia, where really most or the significant bit of, of the know-how around gene therapy still sits. Then the small companies that develop the, de develop this to a certain stage with the pressure to get this into clinical trials, how to refer to the, com uh, the, the competitiveness and, and so on. In, in the context of large, large pharma, it's really, in my, in my view, it's really about, well, how do, how do we, what do we have to do to create a medicine that's available for all, for all the patients that are there? And that then involves serious CMC considerations and, 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 and so on and so forth. And I really uh, want to put this in a context. I think, I find my, I think we, we're finding ourselves almost a little, a little bit in a perfect storm. So we have, we have the promise of gene therapy that, that only contributed very significantly to in sense of the clinical proof of concept. This might actually work. This hasn't happened, um, you know, uh, for a long time. This, this is happening now. And that's matched then with an understanding that um, rare diseases actually provide a model that's viable for the type of companies that create medicines. So there is a commercial aspect to rare diseases that's viable. And, and if you match these two together, it's a perfect fit. And I think these two developments have really happened at the same time on one hand. On one hand, um, an, um, an engagement in rare diseases. Um, Pfizer is heavily engaged in this space as well. And on, the, and on the other hand, a potential perfect solution for many of the problems that rare diseases um, um, bring, bring, bring with them. And, and what you refer to is really, in, in my view, a continuum that we have to um, start looking at and, 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 and maybe engaging in, in the sense that well, if you, if you do manufacture, uh, academic manufacture approach, and, and then you have a successful clinical data, and you want to go into phase three, which then locks you in into a manufacturing um, method, you know, wouldn't it be better to really start at the very beginning with approaches that are transferable and, and, and so on? In many cases, that connectivity hasn't, has, doesn't exist yet. Um, that, that, you know, if somebody still makes a vector basically in the back of the garage and, and gets really good clinical data and, and, and then the company picks it up and basically starts all over again. Starts um, in many cases with, with, with trying to make this more suitable. And that's not just for the regulators, it's also for, for, for the quality systems within, within your pharma, of course. Um, it, that has to start all over again. And I think recognizing the differences in the different spots of this continuum and maybe, maybe starting to, to engage earlier on uh, with, a, with a line of sight, uh, and that's the, the, the launch of the medicine, uh, would, might be helpful. Well, thank, thank you both very much. I think you've touched on some very important aspects uh, facing the industry and the gene therapy and specifically. Um, so I think we're getting the signal we're out of time, but really appreciate your, your comments and input. Thank you.